Not long ago, I was asked a strange question. It was, as is often the way with these things, after a long, happy evening at the local pub. A friend of mine by the name of Simon accompanied me along the way, and once the glowing warmth of the pub had been dispersed by the shadows of a moonlit night, the conversation turned to subjects of a more speculative nature. We were walking through the quiet streets toward my house in Cathart, the way ahead lit by the famous orange street lamps which are still found throughout Glasgow. As our conversation wandered into macabre territory, Simon attempted to frighten me by telling me a few local ghost stories. This was perfectly timed as we passed the old Cathcart Parish Church Tower and Burial Ground. When Simon was disappointed to see that a woman could roll her eyes at such stories as well as any man, he bemoaned that I was always too rational in my thinking to be able to enjoy a good old-fashioned scare. Doesn't the thought of the dead coming back frighten you? He asked. I kept my eyes focused on the pavement ahead, which was dotted in places by the orange spotlights of each lonely street lamp. Discomfort from an old memory floated to the surface of my awareness, and as it did, so I dared not to look to my left, where tall headstones and tombs glared over the cemetery wall at me. You're no fun, my friend said, clearly tired of waiting for an answer. Putting aside the fear of my memories, I replied, I find most of these stories pointless. It's always a friend of a friend who experienced something. When you do a little digging, the whole thing ends up being pure imagination, conjured up to get a cheap scare. Simon was an insightful sort, and immediately pounced on an involuntary slip. Most of these stories? So you do believe in some of them, then? Or, <laughs> he laughed, don't tell me someone as critical as you has actually seen a ghost. I did not answer my friend that night, quickly moving on to more light-hearted subjects to counter the dark evening and grinning gravestones. However, when I returned home and reached the comfort of my own bed, Simon's words rattled around in my mind, as did the thought of Cathcart burial ground and its occupants. They led to a memory, one which is still fresh enough to repeat on me like a recurring nightmare. It was a story I've never told. One I've never wanted to entertain, but something from that evening had finally awoken it. The memory was alive more than ever, and as a fervent devotee of journal, I knew of only one way to banish the phantoms. Pulling my Limon journal from my desk drawer, I curled up my knees beneath my blanket and sat the book upon them. Then I allowed that dark memory to have its way and to temporarily possess the tip of my pen. I will tell you this. The hour or two it took me to write was punctuated by fleeting glances to the corners of my room where the glow of my dim bedside lamp failed to reach. You see, the answer to Simon's question of whether I'd ever seen a ghost is complicated. Like many, as a child I saw things which should not be flickering shadows on the wall which had a life of their own, a toy figure on my bedroom floor in a red dress which I'm certain turned its head to look at me, and even something unseen shuffling around under my bed waiting to claw at my feet should I have been brave or stupid enough to leave the sanctuary of my blankets during the night. Those who are most skeptical will undoubtedly interpret such uncanny moments as the common machinations of a fertile childhood imagination, and I would be inclined to agree. However, though those early experiences fade into disbelief with each passing year, one occasion as an adult refuses to be so kind. It hangs around like a stale breath in a car, where I dare not breathe in for fear of ingesting something both unnatural and unseen. To summarize this strange moment of my life, I can only characterize it as the one time when I encountered another presence. That night haunts me like no other, for I cannot simply discard its chilling revelations as mere memories shaped through the fog of childhood. 
It happened to me when I was a student at Strathclyde University in Glasgow. I was in my third year and studying for the summer exams. Though I was lucky enough to have several friends in the same predicament, on this evening I was alone. At that time, the library was open all night to allow students to study late during the hectic exam schedule. My friends had left an hour or so earlier, but as was my poor habit, I had to stay longer in order to cram in the information required to pass the next exam. It was going to be a long night, though I told myself I'd head home before 2 a.m., come what may. In those circumstances, I often liked to find the most isolated part of the library. There are five levels to the building, two of which are beneath the streets of Glasgow. During the day, I liked being down in the very bottom level as it was quieter, and for some reason my fellow students did not enjoy the atmosphere, which the countless rows of books offered up in that part of the building. Pockets of several desks and chairs acted as islands between the sea of literature, textbooks, and published journals. The shelves of the library spread out from each study area like tentacles of knowledge waiting to burrow themselves into my brain. For some reason, down there in the lowest level, walking between the shelves felt a little more oppressive than anywhere else in the library. It was as though the shelves were closer together, taller, narrower, looming upward to the always inadequate dim ceiling lighting, fragile walls of old books ready to give up and collapse down upon an unwitting passing student at any moment. I cannot be certain that I was the only person in the basement level of the library that night, as the room was vast in size, but for an hour or two it certainly appeared to be so. The only sound I could hear was the buzzing of a light somewhere nearby, which droned on through the paragraphs and chapters I was vainly trying to absorb. Being alone down there suited me just fine. I always enjoyed the feeling of being nearby people more than with them, not necessarily among them, but within reach. This could be in a large hotel, sat in my room, reading a book in the cabin of a ship with the other passengers above enjoying themselves, or, in this case in the basement level, beneath the students and staff at the library upstairs in the other parts of the building. I always enjoyed people being close and yet being quiet and isolated to a degree. It had often been a true comfort to me. Though after that night, I now much prefer the comfort of a living voice and the smile of a companion over a dim space or void. It was for the previously stated reasons that I enjoyed having such a place to myself, sitting with my back to a wall in one of the smallest study areas of the library. In fact, there were only two desks and two chairs in that small clearing. I sat at one desk, while the other directly faced me, the empty chair accompanying it a happy reminder of my solitude. The buzz of the faulty light somewhere nearby had become a comforting drone when my train of thought was then interrupted by a new sound. My mind was struggling to memorize one of Carl Jung's archetypes when the steady tread of feet on a staircase entered my consciousness. This was not out of the ordinary. The library was open to all students of the university, but I must admit that I felt a self-indulgent sense of invasion at the sound. In those moments of quiet solitude, I often experienced a sense of territorial annoyance whenever someone should wander into my world. The footsteps descended on the stairwell, though it surprised me that I could not quite place which stairwell. And it was the first time that I became aware of any sort of echo on the floor. When the sound of an obscure door being pulled open and then shut unceremoniously on squeaking hinges slammed across the large room, I became yet more aggravated by the person's thoughtlessness. People should be quiet in a library, though. Like many, I was happy to hand out that advice while breaking it myself in conversation with friends occasionally. Hypocrisy comes for and from us all. Returning to my books, I continued in my usual way of trying to memorize sections of text using mnemonics. This would often lead to me passing an exam but not excelling in it. 
and these memorization techniques clearly became a crux for me as I mistook committing facts to memory for knowledge. Regardless, I continued on, alone but for the occasional sound of movement somewhere on the basement floor of my unseen companion. Procrastination was also a skill of mine. When I felt boredom creeping in, which was all too regular an occurrence, I'd leave the desk and peruse the books and the many shelves around me. As I left my desk on this occasion, it suddenly occurred to me that the reason the basement felt so isolated from the rest of the building was that it had no windows. The rows of bound paper and torrents of words which I would never get around to reading were lit by a mixture of pale fluorescence and the occasional yellow incandescence. Even if there had been a window to the outer world, it would have peered only into the darkness of the subterranean Glasgow, a place that is best left unexplored in this account. I wandered between the tall rows of books which nearly touched the ceiling above me, narrow causeways of reflection which meandered like a labyrinth. Kubrick's overlooked hedge maze came to mind as I occasionally stopped to read the spines of editions going back from the contemporary to the 1800s, hoping that something would catch my interest, something to justify avoiding study. Such a happy search was unusual for me, but on this evening I could not help but peer around me to ensure that I was indeed alone. My mind turned to the walker in the stairwell, who had entered the level, and for some reason this thought brought with it a simmering sense of dread deep in my stomach. I thought about invisible footsteps, unseen ears listening to my own movements, and how I was alone with this person without having ever seen them. I even momentarily entertained the idea that if such a person were a threat, I was quite isolated in their wake. Stopping next to a collection of books on neuroautonomy, I pulled out one with a red spine from its home and opened it up randomly, enjoying the texture of the paper and the smell of aged ink more than the words themselves. I would have been engrossed happily for ten to fifteen minutes, but for the noise my fellow anonymous student was making. It was coming from a few rows away. The sound was unmistakable. Someone was pulling at the books and then dropping them on the floor. At first, I tried to ignore it, thinking that a fellow student must have simply pulled a few books off a shelf by accident, but with each rhythmic sound of bound paper thumping on carpet, I grew aggrieved by the disturbance and decided to investigate. Walking between several rows of books ahead of me, dimly lit from above, the noise of a shelf being pulled to the ground suddenly ring out, a loud bang which startled me. I began to consider retreating back to my desk and perhaps even leaving the floor altogether when I walked around the corner and was immediately faced with a pile of books lying on the floor, and one of the large shelves toppled to its side, leaning against the other. But there was no one else apparent. Looking around me, I expected to see the culprits, but instead all I saw were the books which had been unceremoniously dumped and not another human being in sight. What perplexed me was that as I listened, I could hear no footsteps. Having been so close to the shelf as it fell, I was certain that I would have been able to hear the other person moving away through the basement. Perhaps they're still here. That thought lingered for a moment and then dissipated as I peered around the corner of that specific row and still saw nothing but the emptiness of the library. Leaning over, I looked at the books on the floor. Most of them were printed in the last twenty years and they seemed to cover a range of topics from biology. I thought about placing them back on the shelf, but instead I picked up the books and neatly arranged them in small columns of their own thinking that I would alert the right librarian when I went upstairs so that they could place them in the correct order. The shells were another matter. When I attempted to put them back onto an even level, they would not move, remaining crooked against several rows of books. I must confess that I persuaded myself that they were just too heavy, but I had moved a shelf once before when helping one of the librarians. Yet these shells were held in place and unnervingly resisted. 
After this, I wandered back through the rows until I came out at a small clearing where two tables and chairs in my study area sat. Returning to my chair with my back against the wall, I explained to myself that the books had been dumped on the floor by an agitated and frustrated student. Nothing more. I sympathized with their frustrations and continued on with memorizing the text in front of me. I must have sat there for another half an hour. As the minutes passed and the silence of the library grew in nature, I felt as though something on the periphery of my awareness required attention. This at first manifested itself as an uncomfortable sensation, but that discomfort was quickly replaced by unease when I realized what was causing it. The seat and desk, which faced me directly, had changed. I was certain that the chair had previously been neatly tucked underneath its desk, but now the chair was sitting out from it. It was as though someone had pulled the chair back and sat down in it while I'd been away, vainly trying to write the fallen shelves. Then I noticed that the surface of the plastic and metal chair had an unusual appearance. When I shifted in my seat or moved my head, I could see that whatever was covering the chair glistened beneath the ceiling light above. Standing up, I looked more closely and instinctively reached out, touching the seat. From the glistening appearance, I expected to feel stickiness, but instead the plastic of the chair felt clammy and cold, like a garden chair left outside overnight and smeared with morning dew. Pulling my hand back, I looked around, feeling as though someone were staring at me. But I quickly sighed in relief when I once again heard the footsteps which moved off to the other side of the library level. The building was so large that this might as well have been in another room, but I still wondered where the claiminess on the chair came from. As one often does when presented with the unusual, I began to second-guess myself. Perhaps the chair's always been sitting out from the desk. The alternative was unnerving. I preferred to think that the chair had been left that way, rather than that someone had come over and sat there, leaving behind something clammy and mucilant. I took this moment of unease to once again head toward the bookcases and rows for some much-needed procrastination. This time I headed to a different part of the library, from where the books had been deposited on the floor and the shelves toppled. After a couple of minutes of reading some passages from a treatise on solipism, I heard the same damn noise again, the thumping of books on the ground. This time I tried to ignore it completely, but with each rhythmic thump, I felt my pulse race, and it was then that I noticed how much the dropping of the books sounded like that of a human heart, slowly struggling. A bead of sweat dribbled down from my temple, and a nauseous feeling then grew within me. The reason for the following is not clear to me, but at that moment I felt a strange compulsion to head toward a specific row of books as though my subconscious was leading me there. I meandered between the shelves, the carpeted floor barely registering my footfalls. When I stopped in a section unknown to me, I placed my finger on the spines of the nearest row of books and moved my hand along them as though guided until it rested upon a book of fiction. The book was thick, a thousand pages or so. It was an old anthology, a century of thrillers. Its hard green cloth, cover worn slightly, darkened in places, and on its front was a strange illustration of what appeared to be a dagger thrust through a death mask of some sort, the facial expression one of pain. Opening the book, I glanced at the contents and saw the names of many old macabre writers, a selection of strange tales from various authors including Edgar Allan Poe and M. R. James. I knew some of the stories well, and thought the book extremely familiar, as though I'd seen it on a bookshelf somewhere before. The memory eluded me, though I had an inclination that some long-since-past member of my family had owned the same edition of the book. I'd touched that cover before, perhaps even read from the pages between. Not the same book as far as I knew, but nonetheless, it was a collection I'd seemingly encountered before. Having a taste for such old anthologies, and given the feeling that I held such a copendium of tales in my hands once before, I decided that I would borrow this edition from the library. 
It was with that decision that I then heard the sound of something brushing up against the bookshelves in front of me. Looking up, my mind took a moment to convey what was there. Through the gap behind the book I had removed on the other side of the shelves, someone was staring at me. I saw only one eye, and it never blinked. Indeed, my first thought was that it had no eyelid of any sort. The skin around it was pale and jaundiced, like that brought from a long illness. The person's gaze was intense, yet unfixed in a way, as though it were glazed over slightly. Not looking at me, but almost through me. I I'm sorry, you, you scared me, was all I could say in a stuttering fashion. But the unblinking eye continued to stare past me, looking down the rows of books below. I then noticed something which has forever perplexed me. Though I could see a chunk of the face and one eye in front of me, I could see no other part of the figure through the gaps in the bookcase beneath. No appendages, limbs, or otherwise. It was as though the gaze hung there, suspended by some unseen force. Beneath it, light crept in between the books, underneath as though the fearful watcher had no body at all. The eye then pressed forward against the frame of the bookcase, and the face pushed through the gap left by the book. Then the outline of a wrinkled cheek in the corner of a withered mouth moved toward me. The skin wrinkled further as the face desperately tried to get at me through the narrow space, squeezing and heaving. Stumbling back, book in hand, I recoiled in disgust and fright, and immediately retreated through the maze of books. As I did so, I heard the footsteps again. They followed quickly behind me, but then, confusingly, they overtook and rushed ahead. It was only a moment before I knew where they had ended. Turning a corner, I saw my desk, my textbook still laid upon it. But now the chair and desk were occupied. The student in the chair had its back to me. I think it was a man, but it was hard to say. The back of the head was white and... About it were wisps of gray hair which looked to be covered in a fine white dust. A musty smell of old paper accompanied him. For a moment I stood there in disbelief. A silence fell, though this time it was not the usual quiet of the library, but instead an unnatural blanket of dead sound. The figure in the chair remained as still as the books around us until it suddenly turned to look at me. It then stood up and stepped toward me, and all reason was abandoned. I must have made it to the stairwell, for I was found on the top floor, gasping for air and shivering, clutching between my hands the old green book I had taken from the shelf. The poor night librarian who had to deal with my gibbering nonsense in that moment was kind enough to lead me back to the ground floor, though with each step nearer to the basement, dread filled me. I was happy when our descent ended at the library lobby, and the basement levels would remain vacant beneath if they could ever be considered empty. The night security guard then joined us, and I was given a cup of tea, which gave me some comfort. When I told them that there was someone in the basement who had terrified me, the librarian offered understandable reasoning. He said that I'd simply panicked due to the quietness and the stress of exam time. It was not the first occurrence of such a psychological break inside Strathclyde Library. However, I would not accept this explanation. I explained that I'd had abandoned all reason at the sight of the thing when it looked at me. Describing it proved difficult. If I say that its eyes were misplaced with an unnatural wideness to them, and that its skin was like white ash and yellowed paper, which the decades had dried up and withered, then it might approximate it. But I could never adequately describe the unnatural quality of that face. Continuing with his rational approach, the librarian offered that it could have been someone with a skin disease, and that I had potentially deeply offended them. But it was then that I noticed the night security guard, who was still sitting with us, had gone strangely quiet. In fact, in my description of the man in the basement level, her face had lost its color. It was clear that she thought more of it than the librarian. 
hate that basement, she said with a nervousness creeping into her voice. One thing I won't tolerate is vandalism of library property, said the librarian. Exams or no exams, I'll make sure anyone throwing books from the shelves is permanently banned. Shouldn't we go down there now and put a stop to it? Security guard shook her head. No, not until morning. Clearly losing patience with us both, the librarian pressed. But surely you don't believe. The security guard interrupted as she looked at the book under my arm. Is that what he's been looking for down there all this time? I loosened my grip on the volume, which I had up until that point held close to my body as though the pages contained therein were precious to me. I... I don't know. Maybe? May I see it? Asked the security guard in a reassuring tone. Handing the book to her, she perused it and then handed it back to me. I wouldn't hold on to that if I were you. This is nonsense, the librarian interjected before standing up from her chair. I'm going down there to see what's going on. But the security guard stood her ground. I'm in charge of security tonight, and I say we leave the basement level until the morning, you understand? I'll keep an eye on the stairwell and make sure no one else goes down there. This time, a grim forcefulness underpinned her words. Before handing the book back to the librarian, I felt my hand move and open it. There on the inside of the cover and onto the first page was a handwritten inscription which I had oddly not previously noticed. It read, Dear Thomas, Ghost stories, ghost stories, ghost stories. I've read them all. Many of my favorites are included in this volume, but what a reality. I know of your experimentation and your deep commitment to probing whatever, if anything, lies beyond the veil. Given your illness, I understand and lament that you will soon know the truth firsthand. Despite your assurances, the thought of nothingness does not leave me. It haunts my waking hour. I beg of you, if something persists of us after... Please leave proof of it somewhere within these pages, so that I may seek comfort from what comes next after you're gone. The paper has been appropriately treated as you instructed, and so I await your message from the abyss. Journey well, my dear brother. Lovingly, Janice, 1937. Do you think that thing down there is Thomas? I asked the security guard. I've never seen it, but I've heard it down there walking about. So was another guard, and it's always at night. I don't know what it is, but you're the first to see it as far as I know, and I think it's looking for that book. So I wouldn't get in its way if I were you. I took the guard at her word, and so I left the book at the library. The librarian remained skeptical and happily took the book from me. He was curious about the inscription, though he acquiesced with the guard's instructions that no one should return to the basement level until morning when the sun rose. Exhausted and deeply affected by my encounter with the figure downstairs, I agreed to collect my belongings the next day, and so left the building well into the night. The darkened streets outside for once felt welcoming when compared to the darkness I'd experienced in the library. Though when I finally got home, I put the security chain on my door and left all the lights on as I slept. Neither of which I normally did. My story could be easily explained as a hallucination brought on by stress, which I would be inclined to agree with, if not for one fact. When I returned to the library the next day to collect my things, which were waiting for me at the front desk, I was handed a note. It had been left for me by the librarian from the previous night. It read, I wish I'd listened. I stupidly tried to put the book back last night when the guard was on her break. When I did, it was waiting for me down there, and it got its horrid hands on the book. I stood still and watched as it wrote something inside. The description it left does not bear thinking. If what it says is true, we should all fear death, each and every one of us. 
as much as it goes against my beliefs, I left with the book after Thomas or whatever that thing is disappeared and burned it. It won't be coming back here, and you should do the same. That man should not be. Part of me wishes I knew what the inscription said, but I could not verify its existence now that the book has gone forever. All I can say is that these events have stayed with me, and now that I've written them down, I do not feel the lessening of that night's effects as I hoped. Perhaps I will let Simon read my account. No doubt he'll try to make light of it, but they say a burden shared is a burden halved. Does this also ring true for fear? My hands were wet and clammy as I looked through the binoculars, field glasses my mother used to call them, making the subtly curved view of my house jump and shift as I tried to hold on. It was inside with them, watching TV in the living room. I could only see their silhouettes through the sheer curtain Amy had hung up years before, but I'd been watching for half an hour. Long enough to see the thing passing by an open window. Long enough to know it looked just like me. I kept waiting for some reaction from my family. For Amy to recoil in horror, or Julie to run screaming through the house as she realized that something had replaced her daddy. There was no sign of disturbance, or discord, fear, or worry. The shadow family I saw through the flickering lights of the TV looked normal, if far from whole. And I needed to remember that, didn't I? Why I was doing this. Why I was taking the risk and putting my family in harm's way. Not that I wasn't watching for signs of danger from it, too. Sure, it was supposedly safe, but how did I know that for sure? My stomach twisted in knots at the idea of it hurting them. Even the thought of it being in our house and near my family made my skin crawl. But there was no sign of it doing anything other than playing the role of, well, me. And if all went as she'd said, it'd be over by morning. But was it worth it? It had seemed like it at the time, and in my heart it still did, but did that justify putting what was left of my family at risk? Letting this creature I couldn't trust and didn't understand into my home and then... Just then, I saw a new silhouette. My heart and breath froze, terrified at the slightest beat or sigh I might shatter such a delicate moment of miracle. I knew that shadow. The curve of its head and the slight slump of its small shoulders. It was him. Bobby was back with us, watching TV with the family. I shuddered in the dark, watching and weeping as the shadow shifted into the dancing light. She'd been right. It worked. And whatever my fears or misgivings, when the sun rose the second time, I'd go back to my family and find it whole. All thanks to my aunt and the strange creature she'd help call to our door. It's called the Jackdaw, and Bethany quirked an eyebrow at me. Or that's what I've always been told. I've tried finding out more about it, but all I've learned is that it shares its name with a little bird. Crow's cousin, I think. She puffed out a breath. What I know is from my father and his father before him, going back a few hundred years to when our ancestors first found a way to call it in the first place. I felt angry confusion. The fuck is she talking about? Some weird... Voodoo bullshit? I'd been irritated when she suddenly showed up uninvited and wanted to chat, but if she was going to talk this crazy shit, she needed to go before Amy and Julie got home. We were all stretched tight and threadbare, as it was. We didn't need a crazy aunt on top of everything else. I was about to say a nicer version of what I was thinking when she held up her hand. You think I'm crazy? 
I understand completely. It's part of the reason I've held off all these months. That, and despite what I know it can do, I believe that most times it's best to leave well enough alone. Death is just a part of life. We all lose people and things we care about, and whilst it hurts terribly, it's the natural order of things. She shook her head slightly as she stared off. I'm not saying the jackdaw is unnatural. I don't know enough to say. All I know is that it works. That it can get back your Bobby. I did stand up now, anger burning through any thought of politeness or concern. What the fuck, you fucking... <sighs> get out. Beth, get out now. I don't need this shit. She kept her seat staring up at me with sad eyes. I know that anger. That hurt. But I'm telling you the truth. And I've watched you and your family slowly dying this last year. Tearing itself apart over something it can't or won't get over. That's why I'm here. Why I'm begging you to listen to me before you decide. My mouth went slack. What she was saying was insane, but I'd felt myself wandering deeper and deeper into strange thoughts and desperate dreams in the past few months. Crazy as she was, she wasn't wrong. I could see my marriage, my entire family, slowly rotting away. We'd lost a limb, but not cleanly, and the infection was setting in. Was I really in the position to refuse any offer of help or hope? I sat back down and she began again. My Jack? He died two years ago after we married in an automobile accident. He wasn't buried a week before I had him back. My daddy had told me about the jackdaw the night of our wedding, had given me a calling stone and a clutch, and told me what to do if I ever needed it. Told me it would only work once for me, so I had to make it count. And I did. Her eyes began to glimmer as she wiped out a stray tear. I had him for another 40 years thanks to what I did. What it did. She looked off for a moment before finding my eyes again. <laughs> and those were good years. This isn't some horror tale where you get a living corpse or some evil thing masquerading as the person you lost. I don't know how it does it, but I know it doesn't bring them back makes them so they never died at all. Her gaze was steady and penetrating as she let that sink in. When I brought Jack back, I was the only one who remembered he died in that wreck. I went to the graveyard and his grave was gone. It somehow, the way my daddy explained it was that sometimes a person's thread gets cut too early, too early for those that love them at least. And the jackdaw can set that thread back to whole. She reached out and gripped my hand. It can give you your bobby back. A few moments before, I would have recoiled at that touch, but now I found myself clutching her hand tightly, almost painfully. My voice shook as I forced out a question that was against any common sense or better judgment. I felt a little shame in the asking, but only a little. The world had drained most of my common sense and judgment in the last year, leaving me with only deep reservoirs of pain and guilt and doubt. And perhaps, insane as it was, some small amount of desperate hope. How does it work? Bethany smiled at me, but her eyes were still serious. There's a stone. I have it, and it has a place to put your hand. The impression is strange, four fingers instead of five, and terribly long, but your hand will still fit. You just prick your palm, just a drop will do. Put your hand on the impression. Hold it there while thinking about the person you've lost. This has to be done at sunset. The following day at the next sunset, the jackdaw will come. It will look and act like you. Take your place until the sun rises two days later. Other people won't know the difference other than maybe catching an odd smell they can't quite place. And it doesn't hurt anyone. Daddy told me it's just curious. Wants to see others live and ways of being. 
that the only danger comes from it being discovered as false, which is why you can't be around when it is. Licking her lips, she went on. He said that it's a trickster of sorts, though not a mean one, but it enjoys being clever and fooling others and will get angry if it gets caught. So you leave, let it have its fun, and on the second morning, you'll have your boy back like he was never gone. She raised her finger. That's the best part of it, in a way. All that suffering from last year, you can take that from your wife, your little girl, it'll be like it never happened. And if you choose to use the clutch, it can be the same for you. Bethany held out her hand, palm up, and fingers curled. The clutch is a small sack, made from some kind of strange skin and drawn tight with a thin chain that I think might be silver. In the sack, there are always two eggs, always meaning that as soon as you take one or both out, there are eggs back inside just like they were never taken. There are always two. The first egg must be planted in the soil of your home on the day you return to it and see your loved one restored. This finishes your bargain and shows thanks for what the jackdaw has done. The other egg can be used or not. If you choose to get the same forgetfulness of the past pain that your wife and child will have, you just eat the other egg. In a matter of hours, you won't remember anything about your son ever dying. She shrugged. Never ate my second egg. Hurts to keep those memories sure, but like I said, I think the pain is meant to be there. And it made me appreciate my life. My Jack more to know that I lost him for a time. Bethany flapped her hand. But that's not to say you should do the same. That's your choice. All of this is. Her hand was still between us. An open invitation now. I know you have no way of knowing that this will work, or if it does, work out well. I could ask you to trust me that you'll get your Bobby back whole, but it's not for me to convince you, even if I could. You have to choose it. She moved her hand toward me in offering. Do you? I took the offered hand like a man on the verge of drowning, which maybe wasn't far from the truth. When I said yes, my voice was steady and sure. On the third day, I crept back into my house a few minutes after the sun was full in the sky. The downstairs was still, the only sound my pounding heart as I crept upstairs. I went first to my own bedroom, peering in on where Amy slept alone in her bed. A wave of disgust at the thought of her sharing it with that thing the last two nights swept through me, but I fought it down. It'd be worth it if it had worked. I moved past Julie's door to Bobby's, and even before I pushed it open, I could hear him softly snoring inside. I stood there for nearly half an hour, just watching him sleep and silently weeping. When I noticed the sounds of Julie waking up, I crept back to my room and slid into bed. Amy stirred slightly, turning to bury her head in my chest as I pulled her close. In spite of everything, I soon fell into an exhausted and dreamless sleep. I woke to the sounds of my family laughing. They were in the living room playing some kind of racing game, Bobby and Amy shoving each other off the road as they raced to the finish. They smiled at me when I came in before going back to their fierce competition, and I had to fight from gathering them all up and holding them tight. But there'd be a time for that, and I didn't want to disturb them or seem strange. It was enough to see them together and happy, and besides, I had work to do. Slipping outside, I went to my trunk and pulled out the small black sack Bethany had called the clutch and the calling stone from beneath the spare tire as well. I figured out what to do with them permanently later on, but for now, I just needed an egg for burying. When I tugged at the silver chain securing the pouch, a puff of air came out, filling my nostrils with a smell that reminded me a bit of ash in a cold fireplace. 
Sniffing, I peered in, trying to see the inside and failing. Turning it toward the sunlight, I glimpsed two small speckled eggs against it in the midnight lining of the bag. It only took a garden spade and a few minutes of soft digging to bury the egg. I still hadn't decided if I wanted to eat the second one, though as Bethany had said, there were already two eggs back where one had been lost. There really was always two. This was all so strange and magical, but it was wonderful too. More wonderful than I thought this world was capable of. And maybe Beth was right. I might appreciate this all more if I remembered what I had to... Jumped as my phone buzzed in my pocket. Looking down, I felt a moment of confusion when I saw it was a text from Amy. Didn't she know I'd just gone outside? And then I started to read. Stephen, Jeff told me not to say anything, to just leave for a couple of days and let this thing work its magic, but I couldn't sleep last night. I believe my brother that it will work, but I'm still terrified. Leaving you and Julie with that thing, this will not make sense to you, but you need to trust me. Do not mention this text to me. Do not act weird. Please. This is very important. Telling you may be a mistake, but I'm scared of what might happen if I don't. So just watch me today and tonight. Watch me close until sunrise tomorrow, and don't trust me until then. I'll explain everything after that. Or if it works like I think it might, maybe I won't have to. Just trust me now and act normal, but keep an eye on me and don't leave me alone with Julie. I love you so much. I read it again as blood began to thunder in my ears. What was she talking about? It sounded like what I'd done, but how and who did she mean? Amy doesn't have a brother. I ran to the front door, forcing myself to slow down as I went through it. I had to stay calm. Get in and get Julie and Bobby away before that thing realized, and then... I turned as I saw Amy coming up to me, a smile on her face. I tried to smile back, but I couldn't hide the fear in my eyes. Her own eyes narrowed as the smile fell from her face, the expression running like putty as her gaze grew sharp and gray. I had a moment to think of what to do or say, to fool it or to placate it, to tell it that I still thought it was Amy, to reassure it how clever it was. But then it began a call, and the thunder of that sound broke the world. <laughs>